Christine, Patton, all dear colleagues. It is really a terrific pleasure and honour to be standing here uh, paying tribute to Haddam Salem. First of all, as my friend and scientific colleague for many years. Secondly, as a clinician scientist, that breed of person, I think, getting it rarer, that breed of person is going to have a tremendous role in the medical research of the future. And thirdly, because his mentor, Barry Firkin, was one of my closest colleagues, part of the Sydney to Melbourne migration, of course, uh, but going back many, many years, uh, Barry was a year or two ahead of me at uh, Sydney University Medical School and uh, the uh, Prince Albert Hospital, but he was a very close colleague. And so, I might say, was his wife, Ruth, with whom I played golf when we were both about 16. The young age at which to start playing bad golf, isn't it? So, Adam, it's a very great pleasure uh, to be here. And I thought I would start off by saying, now, which one is it? A few words about uh, medical research in Australia and medical research as far as the third world is concerned. And of course, the reason for bringing the third world in is that Hatton is nothing if not an internationalist, as attested, for example, by his work with the uh, Asia Pacific Society for Hematology. Well, where do we stand in the science world? The answer is in about the middle of the pack. Uh, you'll see that uh, Australia's gross domestic expenditure on R&D as a percent of GDP is just about on the OECD average, ahead of the UK and Canada, but really well behind uh, the uh, USA and well behind those countries that really depend entirely on R&D for their welfare, such as Israel and Finland. And what do we do with that 2.2% of GDP? Well, we're 0.3% of the world's population. Uh, but we publish 3% of the world's scientific papers, and that puts us 11th in the world, and 10th in the world in citations, 4% of global citations. Now, there's a lot of talk about Australia punching above its weight. It's true. But it's really only marginally true, as the chief scientist Ian Chubbers recently pointed out. But we do do okay. And actually, why should we do better than any other country? Because human intelligence is normally distributed right around the globe. And so why shouldn't uh, all countries with uh, a good research population do good work? Now, we have been moving somewhat towards more applied research. And I took these statistics out for the Commonwealth-funded research, in 1992 heavily biased towards basic with 64% of expenditure, 2009 50 to 50. And of course our own National Health and Medical Research Council, let's remember, has done very well, uh, moving from $330 million in 2002 to $790 million a decade later. But of course enough is never enough. And one of the real paradoxes of modern medical research is that as our training schemes bring forward more and more well-qualified PhD, largely PhD candidates, they begin to compete with their elders and betters for funding and the success rate goes down. I'm told that the likely success rate for NHMRC for 2013 is going to be 17%. Uh, which is not quite as bad as the 10% for NIH, but is really enough to give us serious pause. Now, of course, health research is a continuum. Uh, many of us, and I spent my whole life doing useless blue sky research, not in any sense applied research, and I still believe the blue sky research feeds the innovation pipeline. It's the crucible from which all else flows. But there has been more emphasis on translational research, which generates new products and procedures. What has not been sufficiently recognised, and Alain Baudet did a very good job when he came out here recently from Canada, <coughs> he's a visiting expert. Getting the stuff into a vial or a pill is alone not enough. That's the end result of the translational research. 
you also have to make it work. And that means you have to implement the new discovery. Implementation research and health services research drive practice change. And why I think clinician scientists are so very, very important is that they'll be in the forefront of that practice change. They'll be populating the large teaching hospitals of this country and will be persuading their elders in this very conservative and rightly conservative profession of medicine to change. And why is that important? It's important because today, as Bode pointed out after a survey in Canada, less than one half of clinical actions are really evidence-based and 30% of interventions are at best useless and at worst harmful. Now, we speak through this interesting exercise of the McKeon review. And I must say, having worked my way through the document, which is quite long, I was very pleased with it. The thrust of the McKeon review is, it's in a 10-year framework. And he was urged and succeeded in being very careful not to frighten the horses because of course the thought that there'll be any expansion of funding next year uh, is impossible. There will be no increase in funding until this budget comes somewhat more into balance. But the thrust of his review was to say the research has got to be embedded within the health system. This is an industry. This is an industry that's consuming more for the 9% heading towards 10% of our GDP. And it's an innovation intensive industry. And you know, innovative industries have to do research. And you have to embed that research within the system. Uh, McKeon also points out that those of us in this room are no longer a minor adornment of the system. We're a 23,000 person strong workforce in Australia. And actually, no one's looking after us. And no one ensures that when you've been supported by that three-year first uh, NHMRC grant and you lose it, you're out of a job. No one's thinking enough about that. McKeon wants us to think about that, to manage and support the research workforce. Uh, he says promote and support research by clinicians to drive evidence-based clinical practice. That, I think, is central. He also says, to my great pleasure, enhance public health research, preventative medicine and enhance health services research. Now, within that 10-year framework, he says a good thing for the system to be doing is to bring the total health and medical research investment, which is um, federal, state, industrial, and private philanthropy, up to uh, 3 to 4% of the total health system expenditure. He reckons that's going to cost about $11 billion per annum. Now, now, of course, that's not all going to NHMRC. NHMRC is actually a fairly minor proportion of that. But it is a brave vision. And yet, when you think about it hard, it makes sense. It's attainable. Now, I want to switch to uh, the question of the third world. And rather than running through a whole heap of programs, I thought it would be interesting to just concentrate on three communicable diseases. The big three, the glamorous three, the three that attract probably a disproportionately large proportion of the small funding that there is for R&D in the third world health. And they are, of course, HIV, AIDS, uh, malaria and tuberculosis. Now, the global struggle against HIV AIDS is driven by two separate but closely linked <coughs> programs. The Global Fund to Fight HIV and Malaria, and PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Fund for AIDS Relief. The Yanks always like to do things their own way, but uh, uh, Mark Dibull, the head of the Global Fund, was out here recently. Sharon hosted a, or as a few of us, uh, hosted a, an occasion a year for him, and he assured the group that the Global Fund and PEPFAR work very closely together, very harmoniously together. Between the two of them, they now have 9.2 million people in, uh, in low and middle income countries on antiretroviral therapy. 9.2 million people. 
The cost of that is something like eight to nine billion dollars per year, which is a quite a lot. And this is really the first time that one has been able to speak of foreign aid in terms of billions rather than millions. The program is getting traction and there is good evidence that the pandemic has peaked. The number of deaths per year are going down. Uh, and however, it's still sobering to reflect there's 34 million people living with HIV and at least 15 million have reached the level of their CD4 T cell count where they need antiretroviral therapy. So actually, 9 out of 15 is not bad, but it's not very good either. And one statistic that I think gives you some pause is that a million new people are starting out through these two programs, but 2 million each year are newly infected, and we've got to reverse that figure. Now, there's good news. The antiretrovirals are incredibly effective. And one thing that really struck me was if you have a discordant couple, this was a, a controlled trial, you have a discordant couple, one HIV positive, the other HIV negative, and retrovirals cut to the, to the person that's HIV positive, cuts transmission by 96%. And that is, of course, because the ART brings the viral load uh, down so very much. And it's very fashionable to lambast the big pharma industry, but look at this statistic. The cost of uh, the cheapest, and maybe not the absolute best, but the cheapest three drug combination for a year's treatment has gone down by a factor of 100 over this last decade or so. Now, new recommendations have also brought about new puzzles. Because there certainly are some who say we have to begin to use ART as a prophylactic. And these people say, well, you'd certainly give ART to HIV positive partners in this called couples, whether or not the person is immunodeficient. But they also argue that you should consider giving antiretroviral therapy as soon as seropositivity is demonstrated, as soon as the person is proven to be infected. And the pros, of course, of this it would be much, much reduced transmission. The thought that if you were able to do that, you would actually halt the pandemic in its tracks. Because the person with a so much lower viral load is now not going to be able to infect as many people. There are some cons, uh, and uh, they include the possibility of earlier drug resistance, the much higher costs, you know, eight, nine billion is a lot to raise from the international community. You make that triple that amount, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to find. There are, of course, also side effects. And Mike Toole, for example, from the Vernet, Mike might be here, uh, gets angry when people mention this. Uh, he says, how can you even talk about uh, giving the drugs to well people when you've still got six or seven unwell people heading down the slippery slope towards AIDS who are not getting the antiretrovirals? Talk about it when you've done the job for the people who need it now. Then, of course, the question of men who have sex with men, transgender persons, professional sex workers. Uh, if you want to take a cold-blooded economic look at it, there is absolutely no question that if the world were able to do this, uh, treat everybody, uh, the benefits will exceed the costs, and it's estimated to do so within 15 years. Now, HIV vaccines. Yes, we have to bow our heads. We have to say this has not been a good story. Incredible amounts of effort invested, incredible slender results. And yet, out of the blue, pops up this RV144 from Sanofi Pasteur. It's a prime boost <coughs> protocol where the first injections uh, involve a uh, canary pox vector carrying gag pollen M from the HRV genes, followed by a protein boost, just a straight TP120 protein. And it worked just 31.2%, I mean, far too low to deploy. It didn't lower the virus set point, which was curious. And it looks as though there could, this could be antibody-based, not neutralizing antibodies, but antibodies that promote 
uh, antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Now, what's the world doing about it? Well, it's a puzzling result. It's an annoying result. It's not good enough, really. But you can't just leave it. So what the Gates Foundation decided, together with uh, WHO and the CDC and a few others, a partnership of five, is to say, let's give it another shot, but with a decent antidote accompanying the GP120 boost. Uh, and that meant a fair bit of bashing heads together. Who could be greater rivals in the global vaccine field than the two European uh, big producers, GlaxoSmithKline and Novartis? But finally the heads were bashed together, Novartis is going to provide their adjuvant MF59, which is a very safe adjuvant that's been in millions and millions of Italians where it started with their flu vaccine. And I sigh when I see this, I sigh. The unambitious aim is to bring the efficacy up to 50%, hardly a fantastic vaccine, and licensure by Waitford 2019. This is a tough game. This is a game that takes a long time. And that's chewing up, I might say, a fair bit of the Gates Foundation's money. There are many other clinical trials in train. They're all in relatively early stages. Now let's say a few words about malaria control. I think rather unwisely the United Nations went to this wonderful thought of eliminating all malaria deaths by 2015. That is of course quite impossible. It will be possible in time to eliminate malaria as a large global public health threat. Why do I say that? I say that it has been done in many countries, and in particular island countries lend themselves well to very nearly uh, complete malaria control. Anyhow, this uh, overall global malaria action plan <coughs> seeks to coordinate the research and the deployment of treatment uh, all over the world. And there is no doubt that the situation is improving. Uh, in my sort of rhetoric, I usually used to say a million malaria deaths per year. In fact, in 2010, as close as we can gather, there were only 655,000 deaths. But half the world's population is still at risk. Now, the linchpin of our present approach to uh, malaria control is vector control. Uh, and I think these long-lasting insecticide-treated mosquito nets have been a real breakthrough. It makes sense, but it took a long while for people to actually adopt them. Uh, and where they are adopted, that one simple measure lowers malaria mortality by 50% in the kids. Residual indoor spraying is still important. And one of the things that the Gates Foundation has done is brought forward new uh, chemo attractants and chemo repellents. Attractants for uh, tempting the mosquitoes into traps, repellents for personal protection. And uh, that has been a, a good program. Uh, there's one compound that's now being developed uh, in part for, as an agricultural pesticide also, which is 1,000 times more powerful than DEET, which is in your air guard and, and your rid and every other, it's about the only thing that that we spray on ourselves, a thousand times more powerful, completely harmless to man as far as we can tell. That's going to be a great commercial goer, I think. Uh, now, treatment with artemisinin combination therapy is highly effective. The Global Fund has brought that treatment to at least 300 million patients. And more aggressive programs too, intermittent prophylactic therapy for pregnant women and for infants alongside the routine immunisation has been very effective. And in the highest transmission areas, uh, what is now being done is that there are going to be monthly, population-wide administration of anti-malarials for all children during five, uh, all children under five during the high transmission season. An aggressive approach to get on top of the problem. Well, the vaccine story here again is a glass half full, glass half empty story. You won't believe this, but uh, I walked into Victor and Ruth Nussen Zweig's laboratory a little over 30 years ago at NYU after they had isolated the circumsporozoite uh, 
Anderson, Plasmodium falciparum, and colleagues at NYU later, very soon, claimed it. And I walked into their lab with my usual breezy smile, and I said, uh, when am I going to shake your hands as you shake the hands of the King of Sweden? And they smiled and, you know, it could be true, but the fact of the matter is that was 30 years ago. And what has brought the malaria vaccine based on the circumsparasite antigen of P. falciparum into actual uh, phase three clinical trials is a 25 year collaboration between the Walter Reed, that's the US Army, and the drug firm GlaxoSmithKline. A monumental effort. And guess what? They're now at the stage where the uh, 16 or 20,000 children clinical trial is very nearly complete. They've released some of the results, not all of them. 50% protection in the toddlers, but in, when they give it to the infants, together with the EPI routine at 6, 10 and 14 weeks, it falls down to 30%. And at last, at last, after years of people like myself trying to persuade them, GlaxoSmithKline have recognised that the circumsparasite antigen alone will not do. And they will have to joint venture with others to get antigens from either the liver stage, where of course the T cell would have to be involved as the merozarts are, uh, are multiplying in the liver, they'll put out antigens on the liver cell surface, T cell come and zap that liver cell and fail uh, to allow the merozarts to mature. The blood stages, of course, where there's been an enormous amount of work done and where one has been um, beaten, essentially, by the very, very great variability and mutability of the antigens. And then there's the unselfish vaccine, the sexual stage vaccine, where you go for the gametocytes and uh, if you get antibodies to the gametocytes in the person's blood, when the mosquito takes a blood meal, it takes the antibodies in with it and those gametocytes won't mature into gametes and therefore you'll block the transmission the mosquito will not be able to transmit malaria to another person. That's the unselfish vaccine. I personally believe all three of those will eventually have to be added to the second virus high protein uh, to get a really good vaccine. Well, just a few words about tuberculosis. Uh, here again, the world is getting its act together. The Stop TB Partnership is hosted by WHO with a thousand partners. And uh, uh, it is trying very hard to bring down the global incidence. But we still have 8.8 .8 million new active cases per year. And of course, the combo with HIV is absolutely devastating. Litspin here is as before. It stops the directly observable treatment short term. And guess what short term means? Six months, not very nice, of a four antimicrobial drug cocktail. But it does work. And through the Global Fund, uh, 46 million have been treated and 7 million lives have been saved, so not bad. We are scared witless about drug-resistant TB. We've got multi-drug resistance TB, but worsely, extreme drug resistant TB, where uh, you have uh, uh, a resistance to at least one of the injectable drugs, the last line of drugs. Extreme drug resistance is still rare, but it is in 77 countries, and it is a real problem. But there is some active research, and at last someone is challenging DOTS and saying, we've got to do better, we've got to have something, preferably, that works within two weeks, but if not, then within two months. And this trial NC001, <coughs> is a new combination of a novel TB candidate uh, with uh, moxifloxacin and an existing TB drug, pyrazinamide. That kills more than 99% tubercle bacilli in two weeks as you examine the person's view. It's very, very good. But the first trial, medicine's a conservative profession, the first uh, uh, double-blind trial has a four-month course, and uh, the next trial will have a two-month course. We'll see how it goes. Glass half empty or glass half full? I want to put it to you that foreign aid has 
helped reduce child deaths dramatically and can continue to do so. This slide I pinched from one of Bill Gates's uh, letters. They're always worth reading. They come out once a year. And he's actually projected what would happen if we stopped now and just did no more. That's the top of the blue, uh, the blue triangle. Or if we kept going with the reduction in childhood mortality, which actually works out as 2.8% per annum compounded, not bad, reduction from 20 million deaths in 1960 of kids under five to less than 8 million as we sit here today. And scaling up these basic health interventions through foreign aid would present, prevent 27 million deaths by 2025. And it's not rocket science. This is better use of vaccines, better malaria control, better treatment of diarrheal disease, better treatment of acute respiratory diseases. I put it to you that Haddon Salem would approve these trends and would want us to continue. We must not let this country flag in its overseas aid efforts as medical research and medical treatment is one of the very best uses of AusAid's money. Thank you very much.